Praise the Lord. How many of you guys know that the Lord is not random, but he's strategic? Do you believe that God just doesn't say stuff to be saying stuff and he just doesn't do stuff to be doing stuff, but there's actually an end in mind, there's a goal that he's working toward? So this morning's not random. This morning is divinely orchestrated by the Father. Do you believe that? I want to draw your attention to something. At the end of worship, uh, the Spirit of God was trying to stir something back to remembrance. And for those of you that have been here for a long time, you were cluing into that. If you haven't been here for a long time, you may have to dust this one off the shelf. But there was a prophetic word that came out right here on this stage, and we even made a CD about it. It sparked into this whole thing. There is a fire burning in these hills for all the nations to see. There's a fire burning in these hills that starts with you and me. And I want to tell you, nobody on our worship team planned on singing or doing any of that this morning. That wasn't in the deck of cards. That was just the Holy Spirit trying to communicate to us that every promise that he has said is still on the table. I'm getting chills right now talking about this because I know maybe we got to catch up to this, but I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, the Lord is speaking and he's reminding us of where we're going. And I'm going to tell you something. I sat up here for seven years and watched JT and Jenny prophesy over this place. And I remember most of it. And I'm telling you, every one of those words is still on the table. Man, I'm, I don't even know what to do with myself up here. I've got chill bumps up both arms. Listen to me. The Lord is going to do what he said he's going to do. We haven't missed it. The, the moment hasn't passed us. We're just now catching up to it. You know, real prophecy is usually a little bit out ahead of you. I'm going to tell you this too. One of my prophetic friends in 2015 when we released the Fire in These Hills CD, he listened to the CD and he called me up. He's a very famous prophetic dude you guys would all know. He said, Chris, he said, this CD is not for this time. And I didn't want to hear that then because we had just spent hundreds and hundreds of hours making it. He said, you guys are prophesying a future season that's coming. And this morning, it's like the Lord just got right back to that moment. And he's trying to say that all of this is still coming and it's still happening. Does, does it, you guys have been here a while. You know what I'm talking about. The rest of you guys will catch up. I'm telling you, the Lord is going to do what he's going to do. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray again. Father, we love you. <laughs> God, we just, we just love you. That's all we can say. You're everything. Our, our lives would be so completely meaningless, Lord, without you, God. It would be just such a waste. It would be so pointless, God. But, but you've redeemed us, God, by your own blood, and you've brought us into your family, Lord, and you've brought us into your body and into your church. And, and God, you've given us a hope and a reason to live. And God, we just honor your presence here this morning. God, we bless you. We honor you, we love you, and we just ask you to come today and do everything that is in your heart to do. We don't want anything to be left unsaid or undone that is on your heart today. We love you, God, and we make all the room for you. Do whatever you want to do in here today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Jesus. Man, well, you guys are getting a two-for-one special today. Price of admission doesn't change. You just get a little more for your money. So I want to give a little review. Um, Of course, I had no idea what David would be sharing, but he jumped into 2021 and the Lord told me to do the same. But I have to back up before I get into that. I want to go back to 2019. I shared a word in January of 2019 uh, that 2019 was going to be a year of preparation specifically for what was going to come in 2020. And the instruction that he gave us was, it is a year to get your house in order. He said, I want you going into 2020 unhindered and unencumbered because he said some big stuff was going down in 2020. Now, we had no idea what was going to happen in 2020, but we at least heard the call to prepare. So we tried diligently to do that. 
We got to 2020, and in January, I preached another message. What's the Lord saying about 2020? And of course, this was before all the craziness started around March or something. The word that the Lord gave us for 2020 was, it's time to shine. And it kind of has a double meaning because I didn't realize how dark it was going to get. So if I look out the window right now on a day where it's bright and sunny, you can't see the stars. They're there, but you can't see them. But if we walk out there tonight at midnight, if it's a clear sky, you'll see every star in the sky. So when the Lord was saying it's time to shine, what he was saying is it's getting ready to get dark. But I've called you as the church to shine like the brightness of the stars. And so we've been trying to be diligent and obedient to that word this year. We have been trying to shine in every way that we can possibly shine because obviously we are the light of the world. We're the hope of the world. There's nothing else. This world's going to get darker and darker and the church is going to get brighter and brighter. Amen? We can talk about the darkness all day long. I'd rather talk about the light. (laughs) I'd rather talk about shining because I'll be honest with you, the darker it gets, the better we look. (laughs) Is that the truth? I don't need my flashlight until it's dark. So that was the word that the Lord gave us for 2020. Two weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me about 2021, and I haven't publicly, well, I may have shared a little bit of it last Sunday here, but uh, it was at Sunday night, so most of you guys didn't catch that. But I heard this as clear as I heard the one for 2019 and as clear as I heard the one for 2020. He said, 2021, it's time to build It is time to build. And he didn't seem much interested in what was going to be going on with the world. You hear what I'm saying? It wasn't like building was going to be contingent on whether the circumstances were favorable or not. He didn't say, well, if everything goes the way you think it should go, then you should build. No, he said 2021 is a year to build. And so you know what I do, because if you know me, you guys know I'm a scripture guy. I went straight to the Bible. Where did Jesus talk about building? I went straight to it. And you know where it is? Matthew 16. And David already quoted it, and I'll repeat it. Upon this rock, I will build my what? My church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So here's what we all have to know going into 2021. No matter how much this world shakes, rattles, and rolls, which we know that it will, As the church, we're called to do this, join in the Father's business. What's the Father's business? He is building his own church. He is building this amazing, it's the best thing on planet Earth. I have to tell you this, I, I don't want to get too much on a rabbit trail, but I don't understand Christians who don't like church. I can't wrap my head around that one. I just can't wrap my head around it. When I was a kid... I jokingly say I had a drug problem when I was a kid. I was drugged to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every prayer meeting, every, I mean, we were in church. Look, can I just tell you this? There was never one Sunday in the entire history of my life, zero to 18, where my mom or dad came up to me on a Sunday morning and said, hey, I don't think we're going to church today. It happened this many times from zero to 18. And do you know what? Oh, am I scarred for life? Oh, I'm some religious nut? No, I've actually loved Jesus my whole life. So I'm not a fan of this. Can I just tell you this? I'm kind of going a little bit off track here, but it'll get back to where I'm going. Do you know that the average church attendance right now in America is maybe 40%? And that's people that say they're committed to a local church. So that means the people that really actually love the church go 40% of the time the doors are open. I know we got COVID and that changes things. I get all that. Hey, web streamers, we're with you. But I'm talking about just not having a commitment or not having a value. Can I tell you something about human nature? You do what you want. Whatever you value, you make time for. If I value my kids, I'll make time for my kids. If I value church, I'll make time for church. If I value these relationships, then I'll make room in my life for these relationships. So here's the thing. I'm telling you, I don't care what the world's doing and the people that don't like church. I'm going to tell you what the Father's doing. He is building his church. That's what he's doing. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Can I tell you something else that's interesting about that Matthew 16 scripture? The first verse in 16.1, it says, and they entered the, reason, the region of Caesarea Philippi 
And this is where Jesus has this first revelation that he's the Christ. Remember, he asked him, who do people say that I am? Oh, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're the prophet, some say, okay, Peter, in his shining, glorious moment, you're the Christ. Okay, this is literally the first time that it's, it's, it's realized because he says, the Father revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human. The Father told you that I'm the Messiah. That was big news. And he said, you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. The rock that he was building on is the revelation that he's the Messiah. We know that he wasn't building it on a man named Peter. It was the revelation that Peter got from the Father that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what we build the church on. But I want to tell you something. I've been to Israel twice, and I've been to Caesarea Philippi, and I've been to this place where this actually happened. And I want to tell you, it was the biggest pagan ritualistic site in the region. I've been to the cave. There's like a cliff and there's a cave hewn out of it. And it was some of the most filthy, vile things through history had been done right there. Sacrifices, human sacrifices. This place was known as the gate of hell. So you want to see my Jesus? He goes to the gate of hell to start the church. He goes right to the gate of hell. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to do anything about it. Do you see that? you got to see that. Like I said, he's not random. He does stuff on purpose. Jesus took him to the gates of hell to say, I'm going to build my church. So again, 2021, I don't care what the gates of hell throw at us at 2021. I'll be honest with you. I don't care. Oh, I got to be careful. I'm just telling you, I don't care what's going on out there. I know that I've been given a command from God and it's this. It's time to build. It's time to build. So you know what? I'm excited about building. No matter what happens in the world, that stays the same. I get a little excited when I preach. But it's because it's true. Truth resonates in your heart, and it's like, it's like pumping life into you. Do you guys feel that? So I want to read. I usually have my computer and screens and all this stuff, but uh, we might can get some scriptures on the screen. I'm going to Ephesians 4, and I'll pull it up on my phone. But So how are we going to build? We know that we're supposed to build. Now, how are we going to build? I'm going to start right here in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, I... P- a prisoner serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Here's some good counsel for us. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Now here's what I want you to hear on this There's seven ones that we all have in common if we're born again. Here they are, starting in verse 4. For there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. So I'm going to tell you something. If we are the church, if we are born again... Every one of us, we might have a bunch of stuff not in common, but we've got those seven things in common every day of the week. One for every day. And I want to tell you something about this region that we live in, and and you may already know this, but David, myself, and probably a dozen other local pastors in this region are coming together in unity surrounding these scriptures right here. I mean, different denominations, different races, different backgrounds. And do you want to know what? There's real unity. There's a real brotherhood that's not just inside one local church, but it's regional. What do you think God's going to do in a region when churches are not in competition, but they're actually in unity? Do you think God's going to pour out his spirit on that? He opened with Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is. Why are we here today? Why am I here today? Why is our team here today? Because of this unity. We are one body. We have different giftings, we have different flavors, we have different whatevers, different callings, but we are one body and we have these seven things in common. Everybody say amen about that. So how are we going to build? We're going to skip down to verse 11. Are you tracking with me on the scriptures? 
Good job. Hey, these guys in the sound and the media, they're the unsung heroes of every meeting. Bless you guys. They're the hardest working people in here. So verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to his church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And why? Their responsibility is is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. It's as plain as day. What do the five-fold ministries that are called and gifted by the Lord himself to his body, what are they called to do? Build. They're called to build the church. I'm telling you, if there is any legit apostle, legit prophet, legit evangelist, legit shepherd or teacher, they are about one thing, building. And equipping, I want to tell you this too, because this is something that's a revelation. I have a a mentor in my life that showed me this one day. He's a Greek scholar, and he can break down all the words in the original, and he can read the whole thing. He said that equipping is actually a poor translation of this verse. And we've all said, equip the saints, equip the saints, equip. So it has this connotation like, well, teach them how to use the gifts, and teach them how to function, and teach them equipping, right? Like training, teaching. Do you know what the real Greek literal meaning of equip is? Restore the saints for the work of the ministry. Fix the places that are broken. Heal the relationships. Heal the wounds. It is a whole different thing than me teaching you how to use a gift because some of the most gifted people I know are the most jacked up people I know. Is that the truth? At this point in my life, I'll be honest with you, I honor gifting, but I'm not impressed with it. I've seen more gifting than you can even imagine. But, but to me, how's your heart? <laughs> how's your family? How's your relationship with God? Is this just about ministry or like you and Jesus tight? So that whole scripture there is about restoring the saints so that we can function in our ministry fully with a clean heart. Does this make sense? So that's what the fivefold is called to do. And this will continue until when? Until we come to such unity, there it is again, in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Has the until happened yet fully? Okay, so let me just give you some very obvious points here. If the until hasn't happened yet, we still need apostles. We still need prophets, we still need evangelists, we still need shepherds, we still need teachers. Don't let anybody talk you out of any one of the five because there's all kind of doctrinal whatever that would say, well, some of these are around and some of these are not. Until, I'm gonna give you one word, until. Have we reached perfect unity? Have we worked perfect maturity in Christ? Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. So what do we still need? We need all five of these ministries. And can I tell you what? We need all five. And I have to say one other thing too. I may say two other things or three, but listen. This is not a hierarchy. I got to set some groundwork here. Apostles are not first in preeminence and then prophets and then blah, blah, blah. No, it is linear. It is the order in which you build Apostles and prophets lay the foundation. Ephesians 2.20, the foundation of the church is laid by apostles and prophets, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ever meet a true apostle or you ever meet a true prophet, they are really got one heart. Build Christ in the people. Lay that firm foundation. I am preaching something right now. Then you bring in the evangelist after you've laid foundation and they get more people saved. And then what do those people need? They need a lot of shepherding, man, because they're coming out of the world and they are a mess. And then we got to have teachers. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's the Great Commission. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, we need them all. And can I tell you the dream of my heart, and I believe it's the dream of the Father's heart, to see a real, legit, five-fold functioning body of Christ. How many of you guys have cried out for years to see that? to experience that. I've literally prayed prayers like this. God, before you come get me or I go home, whatever, please just let me be a part of that once. Please, I just, I have to see that really working. I have to see those five ministries really working together to build up the church. 
It's the dream of my heart. It's the dream of the Father's heart. He's the one that invented all this. And I'm going to tell you one other thing that's amazing. All five of those gifts, do you want to know what they truly are when you put all that together? It is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the apostle. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the evangelist. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is rabbi, teacher. What Jesus did when he ascended is he took everything that he was and he distributed it five different ways, but it's all Jesus. Did he give everything to one person and call it a day? No. He, why did he divide it? Because we are going to have to work together. We're going to have to unite. That's the, why did he do it that way? He did it on purpose because he wants us to work together. Can I tell you, none of the, I'm, I'm just going a little rabbit trail here, but none of those fivefold ministries are in competition with one another. They are all complementary. And I'll be honest with you, if you lean way too heavily toward one emphasis, you're missing something else. Let me speak to prophetic culture for a minute. I've been prophetic my whole life. I started this message out talking prophetic. My wife's up here singing prophetic. I love prophetic. But can I tell you what prophetic needs? Prophetic needs apostolic and evangelistic as bookends. Why are prophets right in between apostles and evangelists? Because they need some rails. I'm speaking something. God designed this thing so perfectly to work the way it's supposed to work if we could all just get along. If all the egos could just die and all the competition and jealousy, and you know where most of it comes from, can I be honest with you? Most of it's just plain insecurity. People don't know who they are, so they're pushing and striving and trying to be something. Can we just get over that? Can we just get over all that? And let the body be the body. You know what real ministry is? It is death. It is service. It is, I'm laying my life down for others. It's not some glamorous thing. The cross is not glamorous. Ministry is not glamorous. If you got some version of ministry in your head, some illusion of grandeur, I'm telling you, you are on a pipe dream, man. That is not ministry. Can I go? I'm just going to keep going. Ministry is not about people serving you. It's about you serving them. Ministry is not about somebody holding your Bible and giving you water and doing all. Get over that mess. God. Jesus said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. I'm telling you, God is taking down the dang ministry machine. All this man, 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 build my kingdom stuff. No. Thank God for the shakings. Thank God for the COVID even. Thank God for all this stuff because it's going to separate the pure from the profane. My goodness. Jesus knows what he's doing. And he's going to have a mature church. He's going to have a unified church. And not just at a local level, but at a regional level. I have to testify to this. There are other brothers in this community at local Baptist churches and other churches that we are really legit unified. They love us and we love them and we do things together. Do you know that our worship team has been invited to lead worship at Baptist churches on their Sunday morning services? And we've done it gladly and we love to do it. This, the lines are starting to get blurred. Well, here's this church and there's this hard line and then there's this church and there's this hard line. There's this. No, 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 no. God is blurring all those lines. Who's happy to see that? We're one body. There's one faith. There's one hope. There's one baptism. There's one Lord. There's one Father. It's the seven ones. Can we agree on those seven ones? Can I tell you this too? Side note, I have three little boys and they are all just a hundred percent boy and they are wild and they I mean the number one thing in my house is being a referee because I mean the two-year-old will try to beat up the six-year-old I mean they're all at each other constantly but do you want to know on the rare occasion that they are all just getting along and playing together and being nice and being sweet it does something to my heart that is like nothing else do you know that the father is the same way when he looks at his church when we're actually getting along, we're actually like for real loving each other and we're not faking it because my boys have their moments where you'll be watching out of the corner of your eye and they're like, I love you. I mean, you can see the little, you know, it's in there. It's way down in there somewhere. 
But when we, as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters, we all have one father, so whether we like it or not, we are literally brothers and sisters. We are, I mean, there's nothing you could do about it. I can't not be your brother. It's impossible. We are, we are linked, okay? So we might as well actually get along and love each other. Amen? Okay, I'm going back to scripture. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Can I tell you something? When there's a lack of five-fold ministry, this is the result. Immature like children, tossed and blown about by every wind. Have we seen this? We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body at the church. Amen, hallelujah. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What does 2021 look like? That right there. We're going to build that. Amen? We don't have to wonder, man, God, what are you doing in the earth? God's building his church. That's what he's doing. I'm going to get really bold here. It has nothing to do with who's elected president of the United States of America. Do we have a preference? Of course. Do we feel like one guy was more toward what God wanted? Of course. And all that's still up in the air. But I'm telling you, that has nothing to do with our command to build the church. Zero. And let's be honest, if you look through church history, the church actually thrives in times of persecution and it falls asleep during times of success. We're not giving God much motivation, are we? That's church history. It's Israel's history too. God blessed them. They fell asleep at the wheel. They become apostate. Then they have to go into captivity. And then the whole cycle flips over again. They repent and then he blesses them again. And the entire history is that over and over and over and over and over. That's the entire Old Old Testament in a paragraph. That cycle over and over and over and over. And the church does the same thing. But I'm telling you what, guys, whether we are in the hardest season of our lives ever or the most blessed season of our life ever, this is what God's calling us to do. He is calling a five-fold ministry to function and to build up the church to make it unified and mature in Christ. So who wants to sign up for that? I'm going to give my life to this. I have given my life to this. this. This is all I got. This is all I do and chase my little boys around. Yeah, it's awesome. But, but this is what God has called us to do. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here a little bit. This body is very diverse. And you know, like I said, I spent seven years here, so I have a little bit of an understanding. It's not like I was here for 30 days. I mean, seven years is a pretty good chunk. There is a variety of gifting in this room And out on the web, I know there's probably at least this many or more that are watching on the web today. I'm going to tell you what, there's so much more for this body than we've ever seen. Again, I'm getting back into this prophetic mode again. God was re-stirring up some stuff this morning. I hope you were catching that. Because God wants to do some things that we haven't yet fully seen. And I'm going to even take it this far. This church has been known as a prophetic church of sorts. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I believe, because David actually even said it in his first part. I believe what God is trying to restore is a fully apostolic church. And that I don't know if we've seen yet. I don't know if we've fully experienced that yet. But man, don't you want to? full functioning like you read about in the book of Acts. Read Acts chapter two, starting in verse 42 and just meditate on that whole section through there. It is amazing. I have to tell you this, when I was, I don't know, 19 or 20, I read the book of Acts for myself for the first time and I literally put the book down and I was so upset. I said, God, what happened to us? I mean, I read it for myself as, as, a, as a young man And I said, God, I'm reading what the church is supposed to look like and I'm seeing what what we are, what what in the world happened. 
And I was like, I mean, to the point of tears over it. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Chris, in your lifetime, you will see the book of Acts and you will see it multiplied. And I said, okay, I'm good with that. So God is restoring all things. That's apostolic ministry. Restoring all things and having Jesus first, preeminent, central, everything is about him. He's the cornerstone, he's the foundation, he's the building, he's everything. So this is what God is building. So help us, Lord. Are you guys encouraged? I know I've said this a few times, but I wanna reiterate this. What's beautiful about this is it literally has nothing to do with what happens out there. It affects what happens out there. As the church goes, the world goes. Is that true? You want to see a nation in trouble, you'll find a church in trouble. You want to see a nation that's fallen away, you'll find a church that fell away before that. Is that true? But God's going to raise up a pure and holy bride. I'm convinced of it. It may be a remnant, but he is going to raise up a real, bona fide, at the end of the age, glorious church, and all the powers that be will look at it and go, oh, wow. Yeah. Amen. And they'll be able to do nothing about it. So that's what we're building. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so thank you, Jesus. So Father, help us. We do want to join you in your, in your, in your building of your church, God. We do want to see your dreams come true. We want to see every prophecy that's been spoken over this place come to pass. Lord, we want to see those things that, that were being sung about even this morning. We want to see the fullness of those things. God, we want to see a true, fully functioning, mature, apostolic church. God, we want to see a full five-fold ministry in all of its fullness working and moving and in and, and unity and love and the body just expressing itself in love. God, we want to see these things. God, we know it's going to be a lot of hard work, and we know, God, that it's going to take uh, unbelievable amounts of grace. But, God, we're asking you, Lord. We're asking you, God. We're only down here for a short amount of time, Lord. We want to see this. We want to see your church become all that it's called to be. We want to see your church be who she's intended to be, which is a pure and holy and spotless and radiant and powerful bride. So, God, would you just unite us together in real genuine fellowship and love and brotherhood and, and unity, God, that's in your spirit. Lord, you said you command the blessing, God, around unity. And so, God, we thank you that we can unify, Lord. We got a lot of things that are, that are not in common, but God, we've got those seven things that are always in common. And so, God, we unify. We choose to unify around those things. And God, we just want to see your kingdom come and we want to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Father, here we are. Everybody plays a part. There's no bench pew sitters, God. Everybody has a part to play. So let every person be engaged in building your church and doing what you've called them to do. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.